Are you tired of putting yourself last? Of taking care of everybody else's needs and powering through to meet the next set of impossible standards? In our fast-paced society, we lose touch with our intrinsic worth, with the ability to value ourselves for who we are right now. Instead of living life exhausted, frustrated, and disconnected from your authentic self, maybe it's time to put yourself back in the life you've worked so hard to create. Join radio host and life choreographer Laura Cheadle and learn how to build your dreams and live your sparkle using the five steps of flaunt. Find your fetish, laugh out loud, accept unconditionally, navigate the negative, and trust in your truth. Welcome to Flaunt, Build Your Dreams and Live Your Sparkle. I'm Laura Cheadle, and I am so excited to be here today because I have got a guest who is really going to teach us some amazing stuff. Not only is he going to teach us about podcasting and how to launch a six-figure podcast, but he also has this amazing personal story and this incredible journey that I can't wait to share with you all because I really think he is going to inspire you to do something this year. And by do something this year, I mean make a resolution that you might actually follow through with and do something big. Not just clean out your pantry, but do something really big and cool. And then as usual, I will walk him through the five steps of flaunt, find your fetish, laugh out loud, accept unconditionally, navigate the negative, and trust in your truth, and we'll find out about what makes him tick. So if you are ready to go on this sparkly little journey with me, I am ready too. Our guest today is Mario Pereca, and he is the founder of Launching a Six-Figure Podcast and Launching the Six-Figure Podcast System. He's been consulting since 2009 and podcasting since 2011. He is a four-time author, radio show host, TV personality, newspaper columnist, and all-around media expert. He's launched numerous podcasts and built a six-figure business in seven months from his podcast. I can't wait to learn more. Welcome to the show, Mario. So glad to have you here. Laura, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I had so much fun having you on my podcast. I can only imagine what we're going to be talking about. I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait either. I love that. So let's dive right in. You've got this amazing podcast and I was honored to be a guest on it. And then as I started learning more about you, I was like, wait a minute. Not only does he do these 10 minute mindset podcasts, but he also really helps people figure out and launch their podcast. Okay, let's start with mindset. Why does mindset matter? Talk more about that, please. Mindset matters because it's the foundation for everything. Now, there's a big, I, I want to make a distinction here because a lot of people think that like mindset, it, what you see a lot is you see coach, you talk to a lot of coaches, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. What you see is I found that when coaches kind of don't know what to do or don't know where to go or feel stuck, they always go back to mindset because it's like a comfortable space for them. But mindset gets taken out of context a lot. Mindset's the foundation for success, but it's not success itself. So that's a really big distinction to make. You can read all the books, go to all the events, listen to all the podcasts, watch all the YouTube videos. You can talk about mindset really, really well, but if you don't put it into action, nothing happens. So it's something that you have to work on to develop in action. You have to have a mindset in action, an action-oriented mindset that you apply each and every day. And to me, what mindset is, it's the way we sort our thoughts. So, you know, a lot of people, they tend to pull in purpose and passion and all. And yeah, that stuff's great. And you should identify your purpose and your passion and be actively going towards that. But when it comes to mindset, it's a sim I, love, I love simplicity. I love the simplify. I think the simpler we make things, the better. People in today's world, in today's information bombarded world tend to want to complicate things because the more complex, the more, um, the more, the smarter, I guess we all feel. But <laughs> yeah. if we can, if you look at what Einstein said, right, he said that geniuses can take really complex things and make them simple. Anyone can take something simple and make it complicated. So 
for me, mindset is how do we sort our thoughts? Our thoughts come to, you know, if you look at science, it tells us that the average person has anywhere from 60 to 70,000 different thoughts per day. Now we don't acknowledge all of these thoughts because our unconscious mind is really good at filtering and presenting to us actively what it thinks is going to be the best for us or what it thinks we're looking for. That's why there's that old saying, what you focus on, you find because your unconscious mind will say, oh, this might be useful here. Check this out. But then it's up to us from the thoughts that are presented to us. It's up to us to sort them out and act on the ones that are empowering. That'll take us towards where we want to go. And this happens multiple times every single day. And we typically, if you don't get intentional about it, it just happens by default. You allow circumstance to dictate where you go, what you do and what your results are. So for me, it's like, you know, if you take, let's make the math really simple. Let's say we take a hundred thoughts, right? Just a, a sample size of a hundred thoughts. How many of those a hundred thoughts that you have are empowering? Now, the more you focus on empowering thoughts and creating empowering thoughts, the more that ratio will go up. At first, it might be 50-50. You might have 50 empowering thoughts and 50 uh, limiting beliefs or limiting thoughts. But then if you focus on and act on the 50 empowering thoughts, over time, that's going to start to shift because your unconscious mind is going to start to realize these are the types of thoughts we're acting on. These are the ones that we're you know, utilizing. And so after doing this intentionally for a while, it may go up to 60, 40, and then 80, 20, and 90, 10. When you see the really successful people, it's not that they don't have any limiting thoughts. They have the same thoughts that everyone else has. They just act on, they have more empowering thoughts because they've conditioned themselves to have those and they act on those empowering thoughts. So when you see someone that's a CEO of a major corporation and always seems to be everything that you hear, those people, everything they touch turn to gold, they may have 95 out of 100 empowering thoughts but the five it, the, that aren't empowering, they pay no attention to. They shove to the side. They don't identify with those. And that's where identity comes into the mix as well. Because, you know, the ones, the thoughts that you identify with, you know, we all have these limiting beliefs. We've probably all thought at one time or another in our lives, I'm not enough. I don't like the way I look. I don't feel good. Things like that. But here's the key. We're all going to think that at certain times. It's up to us whether we identify with those or not. You can say, oh, maybe I'm not enough. And then step back and go, wait a minute. Other people have had that thought too. That means I don't have to own that thought. And if I don't own it, I don't have to act on it. I don't have to believe it. What's the next thought? Next, get out of here. I don't want to deal with that. What's next? And if you just brush it away, something else will come. And if that one's an empowering thought, identify with that one. And do so that's where mindset becomes so valuable and looking at these people that are consistently attracting these good thoughts and acting on them. Because if we can take that process and make it as automatic as possible to where we're sorting our thoughts in our unconscious mind, getting more empowering thoughts, acting on those thoughts, then we're going to see success show up in our lives. Yeah. And it's as simple as taking 10 minutes a day and really focusing in on what is it that I really want? Why do I really want that? And what do I want my life to look like? And if you identify those things, then every thought that comes to mind, you can look at through that lens instead of why does this always happen to me? What, uh, what else is wrong today? What else could go wrong? Oh, what a day today was. Those types of thoughts don't lend itself to empowering, uh, attracting other empowering thoughts. And remember, we don't attract what we want. We attract what we are. So if you want to attract better thoughts and attract better circumstances, you have to act as if and show up the way that you desire to be. And then you'll start attracting those, like, those things that are on the same frequency. Mm -hmm. I, there is so much wisdom and value in everything that you just said. And to me, it just shows how you are the real deal. And I want to point out a couple of things to listeners. Just, I'm, I'm sure they got that. They're, my listeners are brilliant. But I just want to hammer home. Not only were you saying, I kept writing this down, focus on, but you kept saying, and act. And that is so important. And, you know, so many people say things like, well, the law of attraction doesn't work. And there's no such thing as a spiritual shortcut mindset, blah, 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 blah. I love that you put the rest of the statement on that. You're saying, yes, focus on it. Yes, sort your thoughts. Yes, cultivate. But then figure out what are you Id identifying with and what are you acting on? I kid you not, I just read an article. Um, I was in the airport last week scrolling through on my phone, and this article came up about this horror story of the law of attraction, which really is a lot of mindset. And it was this guy's story, and he's like, I thought really hard for 19 months, and on the 20th month, I lost my house. And the reporter was like, and what have you done in those 19 months? And he's like, I sat down and I focused every day. Oh, 
great. <laughs> there was no action taken. And you talk about action and you are going to create real momentum when you take action. Absolutely. You know, thoughts in and of themselves have very little creative power. They're the starting point, but they don't have creative power. When you back the th a thought with emotion, that's when they become powerful. Because if you get emotional about a thought and you attach emotion to it, that's what we call a desire. If you, if you define a desire, it's a thought backed with emotion. And when the desire is strong enough, that leads to action. That will help you overcome your fears. That'll help you get into action and actually do something about it. But the law of attraction is absolutely real. It's 100%. It's a law of the universe. However, it's taken out of context hugely today. Yes. You can't just sit and think about a Mercedes and expect it to appear in your driveway. That's not going to happen. The law of attraction is you focus on something so much that you want that it, by, by focusing on it at that level, it creates a deep desire. And that desire leads you to take action towards that and leads you to overcome the things that hold you back. And when you see a challenge, you don't say, oh, I'm going to run from that or I don't want to do that. You want it so bad and you have such a desire because you've already experienced it in your mind's eye that you look at that challenge and go, okay, this is good because I have to be able to overcome this to become the type of person capable of achieving what I want. And so you meet that challenge with almost anticipation because you know that's the next step. Mm -hmm. And then when you overcome that, a bigger challenge comes, you know, the successful people in the world, it's not that they don't have challenges. If you're not where you want to be and you're looking at someone who is where you want to be, it's easy to look at them and go, they're so lucky. They probably have a great life. They probably have no stress, but they do. They just have higher level problems. And that's the goal you want to get. You want high, and I don't call them problems. I call them challenges because a problem is something that you have to figure out. A challenge is something you can meet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everyone, no matter where you get, even if you're sitting back going, I want to, you know, be somewhat, and by the way, this isn't really a real thing for most people, but I want to sit on the beach and sit martinis all day, every day. You know, successful people do sit on the beach and sit martinis, but probably one week out of the year. They don't do it every day. But if you get to the beach and you're doing that and you're able to do that, your higher level problem could be something like, well, now I have no purpose. Now I'm getting bored. Now I'm doing the same thing every day. No matter where, what you're doing, where you are, life challenges you because we're constantly growing. You're either growing or you're dying. There's no in-between. There's no sitting on the beach sitting still. So you're always going to have challenges come up. The more successful you are, the higher level they are, and that's a privilege. So if you're thank when you become grateful for your challenges and know that you have the tools to meet them, then you'll grow to the next level, and that's where real transformation happens. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that whole, everything that you've said and the growth. So how do you do this with people? How do you work with people? Because I know you've got this, you know, business on launching a six figure podcast. How does the mindset piece come into the work that you do? And how, what can people expect when they reach out to you? Well, it's huge because when you have a business of any kind, your business is like a mirror it mirrors what you are on the inside. So like, especially with, say you're doing a lot of sales calls. If you notice that you're getting the same objection day, day after day, person after person, it has very little to do with the person that's giving you the objection and more to do with the energy you're feeding that person to come up with that objection. So if you take a step back and work on your own beliefs and work on yourself and work on the way you're presenting it, that objection more often than not will go away. So, you know, mindset is the key that will help you break through, but it has to be action oriented, like we said. And so with launching a podcast, you know, I love podcasting. It's something I've been doing for about a decade now, and it's something that I've been very successful with, but there's a lot of working parts. And that's why we focus a lot on the strategy. So when, when we work with someone, we start with what the things that we've been talking about, which is what is it specifically that you want? What is your offer? What's the clear and specific problem that you solve? The second question is, who specifically do you solve that for? Who needs that problem solved? And the third question is the one that I think most business owners miss and they don't spend the time to focus on, but I think is the most important. And the third question, after you know what problem you solve and who you solve it for is, now that you're solving that problem for those people, what do you want your life to look like? That's where we start because the reason that question is so important is because I, you know, I learned it through personal experience. I think a lot of business owners, they're so passionate about their business and helping people solve the problems that is their genius to, to help them solve that they just dive in full speed ahead and focus on the success. But because they have no vision for how they want their life to look as they're doing this, they get very, they can get very overwhelmed. They can get very stressed. They can get, you know, you may be super successful, but in a business sense, but are you able to enjoy the fruits of those of your labor? 
Are you able to, you know, go do the things you want to do? Do you have freedom? Because, you know, having a business can, is one of the greatest things in the world, but it can also become the golden handcuffs to where you're tied to that business. And if you're not there and you're not doing it, you have no, so that takes all that freedom away that you work so hard for. So the three questions are what problem do you solve? Who do you solve it for? And what do you want your life to look like? If you know those three things, now we can make a strategy and an action plan that'll help you solve those problems and do it in a, what I call a sustainable and scalable way. Meaning you can sustain success over the long term. You can continuously build success and build momentum in an upward trajectory. And you can do it as fast and as much as you want without impeding on the life you want to live and the freedoms you want to create and experience in your life. So that's how we approach it. Once we have that, now we craft the podcast to be the mechanism or the leverage point that drives that. So there's different ways we can do that depending on what your product is, how you, what your product is for solving those problems. But knowing that initially is how we can purposely build a podcast because podcasting has so many benefits with bit for business building, for marketing, for establishing authority. But what I see most people do is they jump, they, they, most people want to get to the destination without taking the journey. So that stuff at the beginning, getting the clarity is, is the hardest part of the process, but it's the most valuable because that puts into action, that puts purpose behind your action and gets you the results you want to, you want to get. And so what else we do is once we get to that point where our clients have the strategy, their focus. What I noticed for another thing that I noticed with a lot of entrepreneurs is they wake up in the morning and most of them go, okay, I'm going to, I need to find, or I want to find more clients. And the first question they tend to ask themselves is what do I have to do? And if you have to ask yourself that question, when it comes to the lifeblood of your business, which is finding clients, that tells me right out of the gate that you have a strategy problem. If you say, I want more clients, you should know exactly what you have to do. It should just be a matter of execution. So that's the first question that we need to answer. But what most entrepreneurs inevitably in the digital space, I'm, I'm pointing towards here, what they inevitably come to the conclusion of usually is, okay, so if I want more clients, I'll just do another Facebook Live. I'll post the LinkedIn two more times. I'll create more content. And don't get me wrong, content's super important, but content should be the byproduct, not the product. When you put out content, there's so many variables that, you know, you put out this piece of content. Number one, you have to put time, energy, and expertise to creating it. So that takes a chunk out of your day. Number two, you put it out there, right? You publish it to whatever platform. Now you have to hope and wish that the right person finds it. You have to hope and wish that they consume it. You have to hope and wish that they follow, that they find the call to action if there is even one in there. And then you have to hope and wish that they follow that call to action and somehow, some way convert into being a client. There's a lot of hope and wishing going on there. There's a lot of variables. So my question was, when I realized that, was how do you monetize the content creation process? How do you monetize and make the lifeblood, the gas that fuels the tank of your business, be the process of actually creating that content? So you're building your business as you do the work. And then when you, have this, you end up with this byproduct, which is a piece of really good content that goes out into the world, and then everything that happens from that is a cherry on top. You know, you, creating that audience just opens more opportunities. You know, building your business should be front and center. Again, a lot of entrepreneurs, what I mean about the journey thing, they want to get to the destination without taking the journey. What I notice in today's world too is they have this belief that if I have 80,000 followers, I'll never run out of clients and nothing can be further from the truth. Just because they're a follower and consume your free content doesn't mean they're ever going to do business with you. So my whole thing is you need to go out and provide value to the marketplace, solve a valuable problem for specific people and allow that to build your audience. Most of the influencers, if you look at the people that have big followings and are super successful, most of them didn't wake up in the morning and go, hmm, I want to build a big audience so I can be rich and famous. Most of them said, there's this problem. I'm going to go solve it. And by doing cool things and providing that value, it attracted people to them. So the audience is the byproduct. You have to become audience worthy. You don't just go out and build the audience and then figure it out. You go out and do things that are cool, that provide value, that solve problems, and then people will stop and take note and go, hmm, that's interesting. I wonder what else they have to say. I wonder what else they're doing. And that's how you build an engaged audience. I'd rather have a network and an engaged audience than just a bunch of people that don't really care, but click the follow button. Mm -hmm. So the idea is how do you monetize the content creation process? And then how do you make the byproduct of that go out into the world, attract like-minded people to you, so that that be, opens up more opportunities in the future and more opportunities for growth. Okay. I have got 
I love this. And I, I just want to dig deep and push back on some of these things because I think it'll pro provide clarity for listeners as well. I've got a whole group of, you know, entrepreneurial mastermind women that I am in contact with that I support. And everybody's got an online business and everybody is doing cool things and everybody wants a podcast. And I love how you talked about the journey and the destination because right now I've got several friends who are like, I'm starting a podcast. Tell me about your podcast. And it seems like that's the goal, just podcast. And that they're just going to jump on the air and talk about cool things and that everybody will flock to them. So then I hear you talking about the journey and the monetization. And I know that you're not saying every podcast is going to be a sales funnel. You know, it's not like you're going to sell something. So talk a little bit more about where's that sweet spot between putting out content and finding people to engage with that content and weaving in the products so people can understand that strategy a bit more. Yeah. I mean, to me, I think a lot of podcasters miss the value of the actual podcast. They think that it's about accruing this big audience and getting these downloads and getting these numbers and all of those things, which that's part of it. But to me, it's like, what can I control? I'm always asking myself that question because, you know, the things I can't control, I'm not going to worry about and pay a lot of focus on. Like at the end of the day, I can position my podcast as best that I can. I can message it to the people that I think want to hear it or that need to hear it. I can put it out there. But at the end of the day, I know I have zero control over who actually presses that play button. We just never will. We can position it. We can hope and wish, but them pushing the button, them listening, them doing what they do when they listen, that's all on them. I have nothing to do with that. Um, so I don't tend to focus on that. I use it as data. Don't get me wrong. I just don't get emotional about the data. <laughs> I look at it and I say, okay, what do people like? Where are they listening from the most? What devices are they using? So I analyze it, but then I use that analysis as a way to adjust my approach. So I don't get emotional. I don't get personal with it. I just look at it and use it to, I don't judge myself by it. That's the, the big thing because most people will look at their numbers and get judgmental and that opens up a whole other can of worms. Right. So to me, it's like the process that I'm doing, is it, gener is it generating an ROI? And what I mean by that is it's not to, it's not to ideally create sales. I mean, that's the end result. But to me, it's, am I creating opportunities? Am I creating enrolling conversations with people? Am I getting referrals? Am I doing things each and every day activities that are building my business and that are revenue generating, that are revenue positive? And that's why, you know, with our system and what we do with clients, you know, I noticed that there's a lot of fear around a lot of those activities, having a sales conversation, talking about opportunities, talking about what your product is, you know, I, building the, the bridges, so to speak, between what someone needs and the problem that you solve. So what we do too for our clients, which is super valuable, is we take away all the excuses for them not to do those things. Meaning, you know, people, it's very easy in podcasting to get tied up with all of the tech stuff, right? I have to edit, I want to create artwork, I have to do show notes, I have to do social media, all of these things. Now, while those things need to happen, they need to be done for you to have a professionally produced consumable product, which at the end of the day, you want to make it as easily consumable as possible. It's as a business owner, it's not the best use of your time. Those are things that need to be outsourced. And that's why, you know, our system is done for you. So all of those things on the back end is done for you. I want clients focused in on the conversations they're having, the people they're connecting with, the opportunities those lead to, and doing it in a systematic way that leads to decisions, that leads to results. So if you're going to, you know, get more speaking gigs or you want to sell more product or you want to get people enrolled into your program, how are we going to craft conversations that lead to either referrals, opportunities, or actual decisions for that? Because at the end of the day, that's what drives your revenue. That's what builds your business. And that more than anything is what's going to build your audience. Because if you're doing, getting that return from what you're doing from your activities, you're going to show up more. You're going to do it at a deeper level. You're going to put more focus on it and you're going to get better results and better results in one area will bleed over into another. So it's not going through the motions. It's being purposeful and strategic and focusing on the things that are going to get you the result and all the other stuff that has to happen. Get it off your plate get it done at a high level. And that's why we do it. But don't be focused in on those things that detract. Like I, I, a lot of first time business owners, they spend so much time on their website and their logo and their business cards. And yeah, you need to have that stuff. So you know that, so that people know you're real, but those aren't things that should take weeks and weeks and weeks. 
You don't need to hire an outside firm to sp and spend tons of money and time to develop the perfect logo. Just get something out there so you can start doing the activities that lead to revenue positive outcomes. Yeah. Well said. Well said. And, and I love, there's just so much I love about that, but it's the strategy piece because so many people are in their hearts. I've got this amazing idea and they have great intentions, but most people haven't run a business and running a business is difficult and you don't need to know it all. You don't need to be your own accountant and podcast producer and blogger. You can outsource what you're not good at. And even if you're outsourcing something temporarily until you get up and running, that's fine too. But I find I'd rather have people do the work that they're good at because it frees me up to do the work that I'm good at. Absolutely. And here's the other thing. A lot of people will say, well, I, I can't afford to outsource right now. And my response to that is you can't afford not to outsource right now. And here's why. If you don't outsource and you're spending all your time and energy doing these other things, it's going to be very difficult to get momentum and traction doing the things that are actually going to get you the results you want to get. What you need to do is look at what's the cost to outsource. What's the investment I need to make to outsource this? And if you can afford half of that investment, you need to do it right now today. You need to get resourceful with the other half, get it done, and realize that if you take that off your plate and you light that fire and make yourself accountable because you now have skin in the game, you're going to get the results to more than pay the other half. So get resourceful, figure out a way that you can outsource right now, and then use that leverage to build faster and bigger. That's the sustainable, scalable part. Most people wait way too long to outsource. They want to wait until they, you know, if, if, the, if it costs a certain amount, they want to like quadruple that in revenue before they outsource. And it's like, at that point, why would you even outsource? Right. So do it right now so that it gives you the leverage and it takes away the excuses. That's the other thing. A lot of people will use the excuse of it's uncomfortable to talk to people. So I'm, I, but I have to spend four hours editing. That's easy because I don't need to talk. I can sit in front of the computer and you feel busy. You are busy. You are. But yeah. busy doesn't mean productive. Busy doesn't mean you're going to get the results. I know a lot of people who are super, super busy, but are always overwhelmed and stressed and not where they want to be. Yes. And I don't want to fall into that category. Right. And I, I just want to be perfectly transparent. I have fallen into that category. I have absolutely spent six hours writing a blog post that should have taken me 20 minutes. Absolutely. Well, I have too. We all have. And that's how we learn. But, you know, and that's why I hope that your listeners will hear this and begin to recognize it before we did, right? Right. Because our mistakes, they don't have to make our mistakes. No. And that's why we do what we do and why we share what we share. Because what took me 10 years to get to this point, I'd love to see them do in six months. Yes. Yes. And that's so part important. of the why too. Oh yeah. Okay. Now 10 years to get to this point. I want to backtrack, rewind even before that. You haven't been a podcaster your whole life. You had a whole life and a whole career before you moved into this. And I want to hear a little bit about that transition because my show is all about flaunting. It's about building your dreams and living your sparkle. And this is the area where you sparkle. You know your stuff. You enjoy your stuff. And you're driven and passionate. And you've got that mindset of desire. But how did you get here in the first place? Well, it was a long and winding road, but <laughs> here's what happened. Um, you know, I, I believe, and I say this a lot on my podcast and I say this a lot in general, but I really believe that the, the foundation of my success or the key to my success is that, and this sounds counterintuitive, but it's not. The foundation of my success is my ability to be completely focused on what it is I want to achieve, but at the same time, simultaneously also be open to all the possibilities around me. Now that, that, Double pulling at both ends of being completely focused and being open is what keeps me centered and allows me to go in different areas, explore different things and figure out where I'm pulled. I always believe if you go where you're pulled, you'll be much more successful than if you try to push because yes. anything you push will push back. If you go where you're pulled, you'll have opportunity and you'll be able to see more clearly. So yeah, I started out as a chef. That's where I wanted, that's what I wanted to do. And I thought that, and I did it with the intention to, uh, be, a, be an entrepreneur. I didn't want to you know, cook for someone else my whole life. I did it with the intention that I was going to own and operate this restaurant empire. If you ask me like 
11 years ago where I thought I would sit today, I would say, well, probably operate, have owned five restaurants, be opening my six, doing that whole thing. Uh, so I got into the business and I did it right out of high school. I did an apprenticeship uh, at the number one city club in America. And I worked there for about six years. And in that time, I learned so much. I, I, I had a work ethic instilled in me. Um, it was a very stressful environment. So it's a place where people go that really want to get to the next level in their craft. So it was very competitive. Everyone was there because they wanted to be. It was, nobody was there because they had to be or were just trying to pay the bills. People were there because they wanted to learn and wanted to be the best and wanted to get to the next level. So it was very competitive, very stressful because the standards were very high, long hours, very physically mm -hmm. demanding. It was just, and, and we had access to some of the best food in the world. So for me, it turned into like the perfect storm. All this stress and all this food and all the things. So, you know, what do you do when you're stressed? A lot of times you eat. When you have access to the best food in the world, that can become a problem. <laughs> so I gained a lot of weight. And so five years into it, I looked around and it wasn't just the weight. It was that bled over into my attitude. I was very short with people. I wasn't happy. I was borderline depressed. I was just not in a good place mentally and physically. And, you know, we, as human beings, we can justify anything, right? Yes. So I remember driving to work one day and feeling like being in a fog and just not feeling great and recognizing that and going, well, this is just what happens when you get older. I was 23 years old at the time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll justify <laughs> anything. Older. <laughs> yeah, we'll justify anything. When I said that, I went, I might have a problem. So my father's a chiropractor and I grew up around natural health. I grew up knowing how important it is to eat right, exercise, be physically fit. I was an athlete my whole life. So I'd never really had this problem. So I called him because I figured that, you know, changing my body was probably easier because I probably didn't have to put as much attention on that. I could just follow the system or eat what I'm supposed to and then continue to focus on work and other things. So I called my dad and I said, Hey, look, I need to ch make a change here. Can you help me figure this out? I don't want to have to think about it. I just want to do what works. I don't want to toy around with all these different things that are out there. Can you help me? And he said, I can help you, but you have to commit to the process. You have to be in 110% or it's not going to work and I can't do anything for you. So I committed to it. I said, I'm going to do it. And I did everything he said. And in six months, I lost 70 pounds. I felt better than I ever felt. I was back at the gym. My attitude turned around. And it was like I was a different person. And people started to recognize that around me. So they started asking, when you have that kind of a physical transformation, people notice. And then when your attitude changes, they notice too. So people started asking me, you know, what did you do? How did you do it? So I started coaching them the same way that I was coached. I just told them what I did and whatever. And, you know, I turned it into a little business. And I just thought, hey, don't give me some spending money, you know, whatever. And they started referring their friends. And I started working with more people. And, you know, at the end of that year, I never, honestly, I didn't pay much attention to it because I was still cooking. And at the end of that year, I was doing my taxes. And I realized that I made more money coaching than I did cooking. And that's when I said, you know what, there might be something here. I wonder what would happen if I got intentional about this. And I actually yeah. tried to build a business rather than just, whatever and focusing on something else. So at that point, I quit my job as a chef and I went into weight loss coaching full time. And this was new to me. I, I was an entrepreneur for the first time. I was in my early 20s and I was trying to figure this thing out. And so one of the things, most of the people that I was working with, they knew that I was a chef uh, previously. So the number one question I would get day after day, person after person is, what can I eat? Because for whatever reason, when people think that when people are going to make a lifestyle shift, they think all they can eat the rest of their life is grilled chicken and broccoli. And nothing is further from the truth. There's so many different choices out there and options. So they would ask me all the time, I'm sick of salads. I'm sick of this. What can I eat? So my first instinct was I'll just create like this little pamphlet with recipes so that I don't have to answer this question anymore. And then as I thought about it more, I thought, you know what, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. So I'll just write a book. That way I create a little stream of revenue in addition to what I'm doing. And I won't have to answer this question anymore or as often. So I wrote this book and that book, another company, a larger company that I was affiliated with found out that I was writing this and commissioned me to write one for them. So I ended up with two books wow. and I sat back and I go, okay, so I'm sitting in this room. This is the first day the books come. I'm at the office. And I have like 10 boxes of these books and I'm sitting there and the, you know, are you, you're an author, right? Oh yes. You know what that's like when you pull out your book for the first time. So yes. I, it's the first book I ever wrote. First time I pull out this book, I look at it and I'm like borderline in tears. I'm so excited <laughs> and happy. Then I put it down and I sit down in my chair and sit back and look around and I go, uh, well now what? 
because I have all these books and I spent all this money. See, back at that time, it wasn't as easy to be an author. This was back at the beginning of 2011. So I was in a place where I had to, I made a large investment to do this. Oh. So it was almost like a college tuition I paid to be able to write this book. So I sat back and went, now what? How am I going to get this investment back? So I had to get creative. So what I did was I started having these events. I would rent out hotel rooms, like banquet rooms, and I would do live events. I'd sell tickets, have people come. I'd do a cooking demonstration from recipes from the book, let them taste it, and then I'd sell books. And so the first one I did, I got about 10 people there. The second one I did, I had 15. The third one I did, I had 20, and they were just starting to grow. And so the second one I did, actually, and this is a good lesson because it had, there was a big problem. There's a lot of logistics that went into this. I had to go and I bought a bunch of electric cooking equipment because you couldn't have open flames in these rooms. And I would set up. And so we had to go in and make sure that all the breakers were aligned so we didn't trip breakers. We had to make sure the fire department was notified so that there, if there was smoke or whatever, they didn't show up and evacuate the hotel. Well, both of those things happened because people oh. didn't do what they were supposed to do. So the first thing that happened was uh, the breaker flipped. So imagine trying to cook for people who paid to be there without any heat without any no. working equipment. It was bad. But so my train at that point, my training kicked in because I was in many situations where I, when I was cooking, where things were bad, you were overwhelmed. You had so many orders, so much going on, so many things happening. And your training kicks into where you just put your, you know, you have people yelling at you, sometimes throwing things at you upset, but you just put your head down and you keep going. You focus in on what's in front of you and you just keep going and eventually you'll get your way out. And in the industry, if you're someone who's in the, was in the hospital or is in the hospitality industry, you know what it's like. It's called being in the weeds. When you're in the weeds, you just put your head down and you keep going. So my training kicked in and instinctively that's what I did. The equipment comes back on. They figured it out a half hour later. I'm trying to hurry up and get things all done so people can eat and go. And because I'm trying to hurry and I have things cooking faster, this smoke causes the fire alarm to go off. The fire department comes, the whole hotel gets evacuated. It was a big mess. So oh. at the end of this event, I'm profusely apologizing. I'm feeling very bad, just trying to get, you know, get everything done and hope people leave so I can go home in the wallow. And this lady comes up to me and goes, you know, I, I didn't know who she was. She just ended up being there. And she comes up and goes, it was a pretty rough day, huh? And I go, yeah, that's one way of looking at it. I'm, you know, and I'm apologizing again. And she goes, you know, I'm from the local CBS affiliate. And if you could do this well without working equipment, I'd love to see what you could do with working equipment. Here's my card, email me and let's get you booked to be on the show. Yes. So that was, you know, that opportunity. I could have quit and I could have like just folded and left or whatever, but my training kicked in and because I pushed through and passed that test, I got the opportunity. And so I've never been on TV. I never even thought about it, but I did follow up. I took action. I reached out to her. We scheduled something. I got on the show and I absolutely loved it. And I realized I can get in front of more people faster if I do this. And it's something that I really enjoyed anyway, which I didn't even know. So I started reaching out to as many TV stations as I could. And so I was on about 70 different TV shows wow. in about a two year span because I was traveling, you know, every week going to these different shows. And what I would do when I got to these shows, what most people do is they go in the green room, they hang out, have a good time, and then they go and they do their segment. Well, what I would do is I would go set up for my, for my segment, and then I would go watch the producers in the production room because I'd want to know what are they doing, how are they producing the show, what are they showing, so that I could do better because I know how they're operating and thinking. In those production rooms, there's a bunch of monitors. They're all stacked up. There's this, these big boards and a, like, a bunch of people sitting around yelling things. You have the director yelling different things, and they're moving things around and making different shots and all kinds of stuff happening. So I would start to slowly learn what's happening in these back, end, back rooms and behind the scenes. And so I'll, one of these, I'll give you one more story because I know I'm going along, but <laughs> I went to this one event and I did this one. It was in Cleveland. I did this one gig in Cleveland early in the morning and it was, I had to go stay the night before, be at the station at 5 a.m. And it was a three hour slot from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. And I did three different segments within the morning news. Then I had to pack up, clean up, pack up and leave and drive all the way back to Pittsburgh. And I promised a friend who was starting a local cable TV show that I would do a segment for him on their opening show. And it was an live studio audience. There's like 15 people there. Very small, just starting out. I was doing it as a favor. And honestly, on the ride from Pit Cleveland to Pittsburgh, I wasn't really that happy. I was tired. I was not, I was groggy. This was a small thing. I was doing it as a favor. 
but I gave him my word, so I went to do it. So I did my normal thing. I set up everything. I went in the production room, and this was such a small production that there wasn't many people in there. There was one guy in the production room, one guy with one computer and two screens. So I sat next to him, and I was like just watching, and we started having a conversation. Come to find out he had a previous career in radio, and I said, you know what? I've always wanted to crack into radio, but I've never known how. Do you have any connections? So he gave me a couple numbers. I reached out to those people. And that's how I started my radio show. Wow. And so I started my radio show and from the radio show that turned into both a radio and TV show, which also got me into the newspaper and had me, I was writing three weekly columns and do it, producing digital content for the newspaper as well. But that's what led me into podcasting. And so when Love I discovered it. podcasting, I realized that podcasting had all these upsides from a business and marketing standpoint that broadcasting didn't. And broadcasting and podcasting aren't the same thing, although most people think they are. They're completely different animals. And you do radio, so you understand this. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with podcasting, it's all about the content. It's all about, you know, connections. It's all about that, what you love. Broadcasting is all about getting as many people in a certain area to tune in so that they can get their ratings up and they can sell more advertising at a higher price, which is fine. That's the way the industry is. But you have to know that going in. Because right. podcast for me, if you're a business owner and you want to build a business and you want to build it fast and you want to, you know, really help people podcasting, even if you get this huge radio deal, you're going to build your business faster using podcasting than you are broadcasting. Absolutely. You'll, get, you'll create more awareness and authority broadcasting faster, but you can create that through podcasting if you do it right, but you'll be able to do, you'll have more control and It'll, it's just a better, to me, it's a better strategy to focus in on podcasting. And then if broadcasting happens later and it's an add on and an opportunity, go for right. it. Right. But Great. so that's kind of my journey. I'm sorry it took so long. To no, it's an amazing <laughs> journey. And it dovetails nicely into the five steps of flaunt because what is your fetish? The F is find your fetish. And you've done some really interesting things. I mean, whether it's cooking or, you know, fitness or podcasting or broadcasting. Exclusive of those, what is that sparkly thing inside that just gets you so excited to get up the next day and to do all of these things that you love? But what is your deepest fetish that maybe spans all of your different passions? Communication, probably. I love to communicate with people and have conversations and I love to you know, be able to see things that they don't from a different perspective uh, because, and it's not exclusive to me. Anyone can see because we're all different. We all have different perspectives. We all have different beliefs. We all have different life experiences that all lead into having that uniqueness. And I had a conversation with someone yesterday about this, which, you know, that uniqueness, we all think that we're, that we're not unique, right? We all think right. because we're so close to our own story, we've all experienced it. We all think that, oh, what does anyone care about me? But you are completely unique, even though, you know, podcasting, blogging, Facebook, those things may not be unique. Your business may not be super unique, but the viewpoint you bring to it and what you do with that is completely unique. So if, like for me, podcasting is not unique. A lot, anyone can podcast, but the way we teach it and the way that, you know, the things that I can help you do within that sphere is completely unique because it's from my personal experience, my personal, you know, what I've experienced, what I've done, what I've seen. And what I've seen in relation to my story and my mindset and the things that I do. And yeah. that makes it completely unique. So I think that finding that uniqueness within people and being able to help them blend what it is they're passionate about, what it is they love, and what it is they do professionally to give them that fulfillment of being excited to go do that. Because I think that if you can blend those two things, then you'll make your biggest impact in a unique way. And not only will you feel fulfilled by it, but you'll make your bigger impact in the world and other people will be better because of that. I so love it's, that. how do you take those two things and blend them together? That's what gets me really excited because I see so many people who do what they feel they're supposed to be doing because, you know, society tells them that. Now I'm not saying go quit your job and just go blog about knitting. I'm not saying to do that right. whatsoever, <laughs> but I'm saying don't just, don't just go do things because you feel like you have to. Take the time to do some exploration. Take the time to say, what do I really love? And how can I take what I really love and use it to make someone else's life better? Because that's the beginning of business. You yes. know, business is fun and it's fun to make money and it's fun to make money in ways that fulfill you. But it all starts with, how do I take what I love 
and help someone else become better using that. Right. And that moves right into that next step, laugh out loud. It's that enjoyment, whether it's just, you know, physically laughing or just that internal laughter of I'm doing something worthwhile. How, how does laughter play into you and your life and your business? Laughter is so important because laughter is one of those things that get, it really does clear your head and get you into a different space. So I think that laughter is important. You know, I love comedies. I love things that, that will make you laugh. I love telling jokes. I love, you know, sitting down with my closest friends and being able to remove the filter mm -hmm. and just saying whatever comes because you know, they're not going to judge you and you're not going to judge them and you're just there for that. So I think laughter is something that people need to spend more time focused on. Uh, when you're not, you know, if you're not, if you're, what you do is fun and it's funny and you can weave that in by all means do it because that just keeps things light and interesting and fun. Um, and I think the most important thing with laughter is to be able to laugh at yourself. Yes. Because if you can, you know, if you make a mistake or something happens, what most people tend to do or what I used to do is get very hard on yourself. We say things to ourselves that we won't say to anyone else because we know that will never leave us. Right. So we don't have that abandonment fear with ourselves. So we can say things like, oh, you're so like I, our simple things. Like I would drop a pen at my desk and be like, oh, you're such an idiot. And then I would step back and go, why does that make me an idiot? Because it was, I had an accident and dropped a pen. I could just bend over and pick it up. Right. right? It's okay. So it's, yeah. So it's like, can you laugh at yourself? If you make a mistake and you can laugh it off and move on, that's super healthy. <laughs> It'll help you get to the next level and not focus on that so much. So I think if you can take laughter and replace things that are like being hard on yourself and judgmental, if you can replace judgment with laughter, how would your life change? Oh, hugely, hugely. Okay. So accept unconditionally is the next step. And I think that's difficult. Um, what is something that you really have a hard time accepting unconditionally? That thing that you're always like, ah, if this could only be different, if there could only be 90 hours in a day, what is that thing that is most difficult for you to accept unconditionally? Yeah, I think that's a good one. The, the time <laughs> that's <in> the mine. <laughs> day. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, we could all use more than 24 hours, but um, yeah, I think that, you know, certain things that that's a really tough one because, yeah. you know, I, like I said, I tend to not focus on the things I can't control. I like to focus on the things that, you know, that I can, that I can control and make the impact on. But I think the thing that's hard for me to accept is that, like you said, there's only so many hours in a day, there's only so much you can do. And so that's got me, you know, it, it's, it's a control thing, right? Because I built my business really fast and I built it because I was super focused and I really wanted to do it. And I call it the, my, that first stage of business where I built it like that, I call it the wild west because that's part of, that was my part of my journey was the wild west because I was like, I want to do this. I want to do it fast. I want to focus in on it. So I would do whatever, whenever I would do interviews at two in the morning, if I had to, for people across the globe and other areas, because I just wanted to do it. And then right. I woke up one day and realized, look, I've been successful and I want to get to the next level. But in order for me to get to the next level, I can't do it the way I've been doing it. I can get to this point doing it the way that I've been doing it. But to up level to the next place, I got to make some changes. I have to automate. I have to relinquish some control. And I yes. think that's been one of the hardest things for me to accept is that I have to relinquish control. And it's that balance of automating things, but also keeping them personalized at the same time. Right. And I, I think that. that's really hard for me to accept is that I have to relinquish some control in order to get to the next level. So that's perfect because it moves right into end navigate the negative. What is your number one tip for navigating that? You know, just navigating the fact that you have to do that, that some things can't be perfectly balanced, that power breakers go out, that smoke fills the air. Number one tip for navigating the negative. Focus on what's in front of you. I think that's the thing. Cause I think when one negative thing happens, most people tend to jump to conclusions and go to worst case scenarios. And if you focus on the worst case scenario, you know, what you focus on, you find, we said that earlier in this, yes. in this episode. So I think it's like when things all go and things all go downhill and things look really bad and you're in the weeds, so to speak, you know, that training that I had kicks in of what do I have in front of me right now? focus in on that right now, get what's in front of you done right now. And then I'll focus on the next thing. And that comes back to being in the moment. Right. And I think, you know, one of my favorite uh, books is the power of now by Eckhart Tolle. And I think that, you know, he talks about that at the beginning of the book. And I think it's in the preface 
um, where he talks about how, you know, he doesn't focus on, he doesn't like to talk about his past because it, it doesn't matter to him. It makes no difference going back there. And the future will come regardless, whatever. And when it gets here, it's in the now. So it's what do you have now? And it's a hard thing to do, but you can condition yourself to focus on that. And that's where I go. And like I said, it was my training because when I was in the weeds, when I had eight different banquets going up and I had all these orders coming in and I had servers bringing stuff back and people upset, it's like I could focus on all that stuff, but this job still needs to get done. So it's like, how do you block all of that stuff out and focus on what's in front of you and then move on to the next thing? Because either way, you have to do all the things to get out of it. So focus on this thing right now and then get to the next thing. So it's yes. like being in the moment, controlling what you can control and then moving on instead of jumping to like a lot of people will jump to it, it, Well, here's one. Eckhart talks about this too, about how, you know, paying your bills. People will think, oh, I don't have the money right now to pay my mortgage or what, or pay my electric bill or whatever. And then they're like, oh, my lights are going to get turned off. And then my family's going to be cold because we'll have no heat. And then we're all going to shiver. And then we're not going to have money to buy food. And then we're going to starve to death in this cold, ice cold house. And it's like, do you think that's really going to happen? No. I mean, you know, so it's like, if you don't have the money right now, then don't focus on the fact that you don't have the money because that's not going to get you the money. It's what can I do right now? to get some money. Don't focus on the fact that you can't pay it. Focus on the fact that I'm going to pay it on this date. Right. And focus in on that and how you can do that. And it's a hard thing to do, but focusing in on what you can control and focusing in on what's there in front of you now and blocking everything else out helps me to get things done to eventually get out of it. And then it's over because all storms pass. Absolutely. And like you said, all storms pass. And when they do, we're left with the truth of who we are. What is the truth of who you are? That's the million dollar question right there, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, I, I think that I'm someone who is, um, I'm a connector and I don't want to, I don't mean connector by I connect you and you. I mean, I connect with people. That's like something that I, that I didn't know I had in me until I started doing it and acting on it and having more conversations. I always thought it was hard to, relate to people until I started doing it. And then I realized that it was actually one of my strengths. So I think that I'm someone that, and I think my biggest, one of my biggest strengths is, and I don't, it comes from doing, it comes from doing the work, right? The work will teach you how to do it. If you do the work, it comes from me having lots and lots of conversations. But one of my biggest strengths is giving other people the space to be themselves, giving them that safe space, that place where they don't feel judged, where they can show up as who they are and where they can freely speak about what their problems are, what, what they're great at, who they really are. And to just feel comfortable doing that without judgment, without fear. And so that in business gives me a distinct advantage to be able to know how I can help people better. But, and from a personal level, it gives me an advantage because I can connect with people very fast. That's how I can do a 10 minute podcast and still go deep with people in 10 minutes. Now that 10 minutes isn't the only time we talk, of course. We have pre-talks and then we do the recording. So we already create rapport. But who I am is I'm someone that is very, I would say is very spacious. And I don't give that to myself. I've had other people tell me that in those exact words, where I can give people the space to be themselves and help them double down on what it is that fills them up and that allow them to be their authentic self and shine that way. You allow them to flaunt. Yes. That's something that I really enjoy doing is seeing people show up yes. without their mask in different ways and, you know, not judging them for that and not being, you know, trying to change them because I think that's what a lot of coaches do too, is they try to change people because they have this ideal of what their coaching looks like and what it takes to be successful. And they try to fit these square pegs and round holes to try to get them to be that success. And it's like, just because that's what you consider to be success doesn't mean that's what someone else is. No, not And I at think all. that's why a lot of them too, they take on these clients that they probably shouldn't. And then they try to mold them in ways they probably shouldn't. And it doesn't get the results. And I think that's why a lot of people spend a lot of money to try to get different places, but don't end up getting the results. Yeah, Because they absolutely. end up with the wrong people, with the wrong ideals and trying to do the wrong things. But if you can have the space to be yourself and then allow you to authentically be who you're meant to be, you can't go wrong with that. Right. You're absolutely right. 
So where can listeners find you? Where can they listen to your podcast, get a little mindset shift? Where can they reach out to you if they're thinking, oh, a strategic podcast? I might need that. Yeah, well, there's a... I have two websites I'll give you. Uh, my personal website is mariopereca.com. So it's just my first and last name.com. That's where you can find 10 minute mindset. That's where you can find uh, the information about me and my speaking and all of those things. Launching a podcast.com is my business. That's where you go. If you want more information about the podcast and about working with me directly, launching a podcast.com is, you know, that's where you'll go for all that information, but you can also text me directly. So I'm going to give people their number because I texting is just the fastest, easiest way for me to, you know, get in touch with people. So if you really want to talk, you can shoot me a text 412-226-4421 is that number 412-226-4421. Shoot me a text. You'll get a text back that asks you for some information just so I know who I'm talking to and what it's all about. And then, but it is really me. So if you send texts, I will be able to answer you. We'll be able to have one on a one-on-one -on -one conversation via text. And then if it makes sense and you want more or you will have deeper things that you want to actually talk about, we can schedule a time to actually hop on a call or a zoom and actually talk through it. But the best way to reach me is through text. And that number again, just one more time to give it to you is 412-226-4421. And I will put, I'm writing that down. What was the area code again? 412. 412-226-4421. You got it. And I will put that, I'll make sure that that's front and center in the show notes yeah, as well. Because, absolutely. hey, listeners, I know from personal experience, Mario is a ton of fun to talk to. <laughs> Tons of fun. And you'll get amazing information from him. So, Thank you so much for being on my show today, for sharing yourself, your heart, your sparkle, your journey, all of that. Um, I had a, an amazing time. I know my listeners got a lot about a lot of information about you, about how maybe they could utilize your services, or at least how they can think differently, you know, in terms of their own business, in terms of strategy, and in terms of mindset. So, Thank you for being here and listeners, as usual, have an amazing week and don't forget to flaunt. Tune in next time to flaunt, build your dreams, live your sparkle with radio host Laura Cheadle every Wednesday at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern time on syndicated Dream Vision 7 radio network. Come release self-judgment, reveal your naked self-worth and re-choreograph a life filled with joy. Flaunt. Find your fetish, laugh out loud, accept unconditionally, navigate the negative, and trust in your truth. Find out more at lauracheadle.com. That's L-O-R-A-C-H-E-A-D-L-E.com.